Good evening, my name is uh, Rob Pollard and I'm the developer for Sojour, which is a virtual tabletop or uh, VTT as we'll refer to it from here on in. Now some of you are probably thinking, oh no, not, not another VTT, uh, but this one has one fundamental difference from all the others in that it, it's focused for solo play. Um, uh, basically, uh, as a role player myself, as a solo role player, I, I tried to use many of the commercial VTTs that are out there, uh, and they're all very good, but they're all very good at multiplayer uh, VTT type stuff. Uh, and I, I found it exceedingly difficult to get on with them in terms of um, being able to run a, a solo uh, campaign. Uh, and that kind of prompted me to write uh, my own VTT. Well, it was that and the price, because many of the commercial VTTs, not only were they expensive, but many of them kind of insisted that you bought your games all over again, uh, especially the scenarios. And because I'm one of those people, I like to have things in book form, physical book form. And uh, some of these books are really expensive. And I don't want to have to rebuy them in a special format to be able to use it in a commercial VGT. Uh, hence why I wrote Sojour. Now, uh, Sojour enables you to do many advanced things, like for instance, you can pull in maps from your scenario books. You can even create round tokens, character tokens, directly from your scenario books. And it does a whole host of other things. Uh, but its primary purpose is to act as a journal and to enable you to narrate your uh, journeys. And to go with it, it provides you with a, a good mapping system and a system for managing time. Uh, and we'll cover all of these things uh, when I go through the demonstration. Now, I've done one of these videos before. I did it for Sojour when it was in beta and it came out at around an hour. So this is gonna be a long video. So I highly recommend, uh, unless you wanna sit through it that is, that you go down to the description and you'll find various time codes uh, which will take you to various specific topics that you can uh, watch if you're particularly interested in those. So uh, the first thing I'm going to do, uh, I've actually uninstalled Sojour from my desktop and uh, will install it from scratch. Before I do that, I probably should mention um, how you folks can get hold of it. So uh, ultimately, uh, the intent is to sell it on Drive-Thru RPG and it will be sold for $10 USD. It's, uh, it's not there yet, but as soon as it becomes available, I'll put a link in the description below. So just open that up, and if there's a link there, uh, just go to that. Uh, for your $10, you get Sojour, you'll get free updates as I update the system, uh, because Sojour, at the end of the day, I'm using it for my own game. So as I think of ideas, as you people send me ideas, uh, I'll most likely add to it and you'll reap uh, the benefits of, uh, uh, of the updates. Uh, and also, uh, I'm a great believer of not putting DRM in my software. Uh, the, the way I look at it is uh, many pirates, uh, they're, they're pretty switched on and if they really want something, uh, especially in a digital domain, they'll get it. You can't stop them. Uh, so uh, in my mind, why put DRM in, uh, it's only going to hurt the legitimate purchasers, so it doesn't come with DRM. Once you buy it, it's yours for life, basically. So anyway, let's get on with the, uh, uh, the installation. So it's a standard Windows installation. I've actually tested this in Windows 10 on a, a very small uh, two-core laptop and on this machine, which is obviously uh, running Windows 11. Uh, for those of you uh, desperate to run this on Linux or OS X, I haven't tested this on either of those and it, it, it might not work. Uh, but I, I will say it uses older technologies like DirectX 9, so I'm guessing there's a chance you folks get Proton to get it to work and uh, Mono. Uh, it's written in .NET, so uh, yeah, I guess there is a possibility to get it working under those systems. but. I haven't tested that. I, I can't hand on heart give you any guarantees about that. So anyway, let's get the installer up and running. So here we are, typical uh, Windows installer. Uh, so let's get that going. Uh, usual license agreement. 
so you get a choice of two things to install Sojour, which you have to install, obviously, and also some optional calendars. So uh, Sojour comes with three optional example calendars, uh, and they're basically calendars that I've created for various commercial uh, games that are out there. Uh, and they're provided for two reasons. Firstly, uh, for owners of said games to be able to uh, have calendars ready to use with them without having to create them from scratch. And also to enable people to actually look at them within Sojour to see how I built them up. And in that way, it should give you ideas on how to build your own calendars. Because one thing Sojour does is it enables you to build calendars because uh, the majority of role-playing games do not use the Western Gregorian calendar. They, they tend to use completely made-up calendars. And Sojour lets you very easily create your own. Let's go next and hit install. This can take a little bit of time, especially for the uh, uh, the PDF readers. Just just be patient whilst it's installing. Uh, I've tested this on a completely empty and blank machine. You know, a brand new Windows install, and the installer seems to work. Uh, but obviously, there's just one of me. I have two machines, and who knows? Somebody might find a problem out there. Uh, but obviously, uh, my intent is that. Get any problems you folks find fixed so uh, all you need to do is email me and uh, uh, we can fix it but it has had a lot of testing um, uh, I have a, a management system uh, called Jira which I use to manage this project and the last time I looked uh, just the detailed testing alone that doesn't even include user testing uh, 200 hours got pumped in so that's a lot of hours to pump in but it is a complex piece of software that I'm pretty certain uh, especially for a, a, a first version release, people might find issues, but hopefully not, because it has been well tested. So, Sojour is installed now. Uh, to run it up, it's the usual thing, double click and away you go. Uh, so, uh, other things that I should probably say about Sojour right now, it's uh, role-playing game neutral, you can use it with any role-playing game, and also it stores data on your local drives, there's no networking, unless you set it up, that there's no networking involved at all. Uh, so the data is yours, you don't need to pay a subscription or anything silly like that, it's completely yours. And I've designed it as well so that the majority of data it uses in here, your journals, your maps and so forth, they're going to be saved in non-proprietary formats to enable you to use your data in other apps. Because the way I look at it, you put all that time and effort in to create your data, so you should have the right to use it wherever you want it. Now, there, there are some types of data in the system which I, I can't, um, I guess, give you direct access to simply because they're very specific to Sojour. One example being the calendars. Um, it's a specific uh, Sojour format, so there's no way you can open those up in a, a different tool. But I do allow you to import and export them. And in fact, I'm going to do that now. What I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to import a calendar for my pretend role-playing game. So... I better cover that off first. So in order to avoid, I guess, uh, copyright infringement and all that kind of thing, because at the end of the day, the big uh, role-playing game publishers, that they spend a lot of money uh, producing the art for their scenarios and their rule books. Uh, and I think it'd be wrong if I uh, produce a video showing their artwork and so forth, because, uh, uh, and it can open me up to uh, uh, various IP infringements. So to that end, I've made a completely made up RPG, a really bad one, but bear with me. Um, it has various maps that I've created uh, using Campaign Cartographer. Uh, what I will say is I'm brand new to that, so please don't judge Campaign Cartographer on the maps that you see. Uh, although I think they're pretty good, but yeah, uh, just bear that in mind. So uh, yeah, everything that you'll see is IP free in order uh, not to cause various legal issues. Now, before I go any further, uh, there is a manual that uh, comes with Sojour, and you can always view that manual by clicking this button here. And there you go, there's the manual. It's a, um, I think it's, is it a little over, uh, it's been a while, 126 pages, so there's quite a few pages in it. Uh, it's well illustrated, uh, lots of diagrams, pretty pictures, and explanations, so, um, if you have any questions about Sojour, theoretically, uh, the answers should be buried in this manual somewhere. 
everything in it is well linked so you know you can click on things and it'll take you straight to the various sections and so forth and of course there's a, a linkable uh, table of contents at the beginning so and if you want to read about map scaling you click that and away you go it takes you to map scaling so yeah this manual it's always available for you and uh, it, it should be able to help you out but i'm hoping that I've designed Soldier in such a way that it's straightforward to use anyway, uh, and the manual is just there as a backup. But there are other sources of help. There's obviously this YouTube channel where I will be posting regularly once uh, Soldier goes out, uh, but also the maps and the journals themselves also have uh, shortcuts help. Now I can't show you the journal one because we haven't created one yet, but this pane here, the mapping pane, I can show you its shortcut pane, so I've clicked that. So this is the helper pane for maps and all it does, it gives you the keyboard shortcuts and various other shortcuts for doing various things. It's a stay on top window, but it's also modeless. What that means is you can carry on working uh, even with it up. You know, you can drag it off to one side and use it as an aid memoir basically. So it's, it's a handy window to enable you to find out what those uh, quick shortcuts are without necessarily having to read a hundred odd page manual. And uh, the journals have the same thing, and I'll show you the journal one when we get there. So when you first install Sojour, it looks pretty empty and barren. You get like one calendar, the Gregorian calendar, which is the standard Western uh, calendar used on Earth. Uh, it's non-editable, so it's not like you can even do anything with it other than use it. Uh, so. What I'm going to do, rather than create a calendar from scratch uh, for the purposes of this uh, video, I'll actually import one that I created earlier. Uh, and the reason for that is uh, it'll just take too much time. And I'd much rather have a dedicated video showing you how to create calendars and I'll take you through it slowly. So here's one for the North Sojourney calendar as part of my made up game. And we can actually double click into that to show you uh, how calendars are made up in Sojour. So firstly, <clears throat> all calendars are made up the same way. They all use uh, the same build techniques and they all consist of a calendar, a year, and one or more time units that you put together to make your year up. Um, now, obviously the manual goes into it in more detail. I will go into it in more detail in a specific video for calendars. Uh, but in here, uh, you set up what your year looks like here. You set up what the short and long date formats are like here. And these are live fields as well, as you type uh, the red writing kind of updates. Um, so you can see exactly how your years are gonna look. And you can actually see what your calendar is gonna look like um, and test it. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a great tool. So as you're making calendars up, you, you hit the, um, uh, the example date button and it'll show you what your calendar looks like so far. So you see the Sojourney calendar is pretty unique and uh, I've tested this system with uh, Traveller calendars, I created a Traveller calendar, I created a Dungeons and Dragons Sword Coast calendar, I also created a RuneQuest uh, Grantha calendar, so it's a very capable system. And of course you get the, um, the, the normal Gregorian calendar should you be role playing something uh, on Earth as it were. So the, the next thing to do is to uh, create a rule set. Now Sojour, it's rule set light. It doesn't model very much on rule sets at all. Uh, and the reason for that is I've played numerous VTTs that do. And now this is probably a personal thing from my point of view, but I left some of those game sessions thinking, hmm, I played D&D, but I kind of didn't <laughs> and, and the reason why is because so much of what makes that role-playing game that particular role-playing game uh, I didn't get involved with because it's all automated uh, I could have been playing any game at that point uh, and you know for, for I guess multiplayer over the internet gaming that's probably a good thing because you want things to be as smooth as possible but as a solo role-player uh, half the fun is exploring the rules. You want to not only explore the narrative, you want to explore those rules. So, and to that end, Sojour doesn't go that deeply into the rule side, very, very lightweight. But it also means you can use Sojour with any rule set that you like. So we're going to add a rule set. Uh, we're going to call the this one the Windows Guardians rule set. Again, completely made up, uh, but you can call it whatever you want. 
Uh, other than the name, the only other thing you have to specify is the measurement system, and this determines what measurements you're going to see on your maps. Now, throughout the rest of this demo, because I'm going to pick metric, you're going to see everything in metric. You're going to see all the range measurements in metric, the scales are going to be in metric, everything's going to be in metric. But don't despair, if, if you're using Imperial, uh, Social supports Imperial just fine. Uh, it's just a case of picking the appropriate measurement system for the rule set that you're using. And in general, just by reading your rules, you'll get a good feel for what um, measurement systems are used. Now, Window Guardians, as I said, that's a metric system, so we'll pick metric and hit OK. Once you create your rule set, you're given uh, four folders under your rule set. Um, and uh, they're as follows. You have a campaign folder, and that's for storing all of your campaigns. You can have as many of those as you want. You have a document templates folder where you're going to add um, document templates. And all document templates are there, I guess, instances of common blank documents that you can then use to create copies of. For instance, a great example is a character sheet. So you might store a character sheet document template here, and then every time you want a character sheet, Sojour will, will let you pick that template and you'll get a, a brand new uh, copy of that template. You also get a tokens palette. There's nothing there yet, but that's for all your monsters, mobs, and other things that you're gonna drag to the map. I'll show you that later on. And you also get turn sequences. Now what turn sequences do, they let you model turns uh, any way that you would like. It can model uh, both normal turns, it can model turns of phases as well. It's quite advanced in that respect. And you can even uh, model initiative. So you can have it keep track of initiative, say during combat, for example. Uh, and I'll briefly show that uh, towards the end of this video. Uh, but that's one of those um, topics where it really needs its own video uh, to go into detail with. So I think before we start, we're going to add a document template. And uh, as most of you know, most role-playing games will have a character sheet, generally speaking. So uh, uh, our Windows Guardians one does. It has a, a terrible character sheet, but it's a good one for this demo. So here's uh, my Window Guardian character sheet. It's a PDF, uh, as I suspect most of your character sheets will be. And of course, because you're going to be using, I guess on the whole, commercial uh, PDFs, your character sheets are going to look a lot better than this one. Uh, and uh, basically, Sojour will take PDFs or rich text format documents as your character sheets, or even blank ones that you can uh, later update. So all you need to do is give your template a name. So I'm going to call this one the character sheet, that's exactly what it is. And hit OK. So we now have a document template of a blank character sheet, which can be used anywhere in the system. It, it aids with consistency because without it being a template, uh, you, you'll find you'll be hunting on a hard drive for a character sheet, whereas by adding it as a template, it's in a drop down list and you can pick it straight away. Now, character sheets, uh, they have one unique thing in that Sojour actually enables you to designate a single document template under rule set as that rule set's character sheet. And we're going to do that now uh, by clicking this. And you get a nice little star turn up. And what that does, every time I create a character, it's going to automatically give it a copy of this character sheet without me having to do anything. And that's just a great way to save time. So, so that's the rule set. So that's a very, very lightweight uh, on purpose. So uh, what we're going to do now, we're going to add a campaign because all of your ventures need to run as part of a campaign. So let's add that now. Uh, let's call this one the Northern Reaches. Again, completely made up. And uh, the, other than the name of the campaign, the other thing you need to pick uh, is the calendar. Uh, quite important. Now the list of calendars you get to pick from are the list that you've defined up here. So whichever calendars you have up here will be in this list here. And I say Sojour does come with three optional um, calendars for various commercial role-playing games and you can add those as per the instructions of the manual. You're basically importing them so uh, and they'll be there ready for you. So in order to prove that Sojour can work with non-standard calendars, we're going to use the North Sojourney one for the Northern Reaches. And there you go, we have our campaign. Now your campaign, you can think of it as a container for everything that's part of that campaign. It keeps everything in one place. Um, now 
some of you might be thinking, oh, this uh, tree view is going to get a bit big and a bit messy, especially if I use this over time. And, and you know, it, it will. You will end up with, I guess, a lot of nodes ultimately. But Sojour remembers the state of all nodes. Uh, when, so, you know, if I close that and, uh, I don't know, if I shut Sojour down, restart it, it should remember that I've closed that node. There you go. So it, it remembers the state of pretty much everything, including the uh, the, the tree view. Uh, so ultimately, you'll leave open just the bits that you're interested in. Now, we're going to be a little bit artificial here because I'm demonstrating this to you. I'm just going to leave everything open so we can we can talk about everything. Okay, back to campaign. So you've got your campaign, which is this container. Under it, you have a folder for campaign assets. Now, campaign assets, they're, they're tokens, just like characters, they're tokens as well, as are tokens on the tokens palette. But each of the three types of tokens have slightly uh, different uses. Uh, that's described in much more detail in the manual, and we'll talk about that uh, when I put up a, a video specifically on tokens. But in essence, um, campaign assets, uh, firstly, they're unique, so um, there's only one of those. So if you were to drag them to your map, you'd only ever have one. Uh, they are a token, as I mentioned, so you can be dragged to the map. You can associate a document with them. And campaign assets, they tend to be, I don't know, a good example in a sci-fi campaign might be your player's starship. That is a perfect campaign asset. It's, it's neither a monster to go on the uh, tokens palette, nor is it a character, but it's, it's an asset in that campaign. And that's what the campaign assets folder is for. Next, you get an instance of the calendar that uh, you picked. So whilst the calendars under the calendars folders define how a calendar works, this is an actual instance, that calendar. And this instance is uh, private to this campaign. Uh, uh, so everything I do in here is accessible by this campaign only. So uh, here's a calendar. It's, you can set the dates from here by picking a day, you know, moving the months forward. You can change the time, you can even change the year by typing in there and then you just click the button and boom, that's the current date. And everything in this campaign is running off this current date, no matter how many journals you create and so forth, they're all kept in sync uh, with the date and time that you have here. Uh, now, Sojour also allows you to add events. Uh, so, you know, like on the, maybe on the 40th, it's a public holiday. And we'll make that annual recurring. So, and you can have as many events per um, day as you wish. Uh, and whenever that day comes around, you'll get a nice reminder in your journal and it'll display the text that it shows here. So that's a great way to, I guess, add some life uh, to uh, your yearly campaign cycle. So that's kind of it's very, vitally important because I, I'm a great believer in uh, regulating time. Uh, and normally, when you're playing a role-playing game, regulating time is either a, uh, a dungeon master or as a, uh, a solo player, is, it can be a right paid, <laughs> basically. But Sojour automates a lot of that. And I, I've personally found, having used Sojour to play quite a few of my games, that uh, because it's accurately keeping track of time, it helps kickstart your imagination about what's going on. Like, for instance, oh, look, it's lunchtime. So, Obviously, my character's hungry and they're going to go off for lunch. Uh, and that adds to the narrative of the, the story you're trying to create. Uh, and it adds those things in such a way that perhaps you wouldn't normally think of doing those just by randomly going through your narrative. Next, you get the characters folder. In that are all your major characters. So not just your party characters, all of your campaign major characters. Now, it's acknowledged that, you know, some campaigns can have hundreds of major characters and you don't want to be dealing with them all at the same time. So you can actually deactivate them. Uh, and once they're deactivated, they they stay under the deactivated folder, but they don't appear anywhere else in Sojour. Although Sojour does remember everything about them, so if you reactivate them, they'll reappear on all the same maps they're originally on and so forth. So uh, it's quite an intelligent feature. Uh, I'll show you uh, that later on. You get a documents folder and in there you can add uh, rich text documents or PDFs, uh, anything that you like to keep track of your campaign. Inside of that is a um, character sheets folder which you can't add anything to. Uh, I'm right clicking right now and there's no menu. And the reason for that is that automatically shows the documents related to any characters that you add. In this case it'll be a character sheet. 
Uh, and the reason for that is uh, when I originally designed Sojour, the only way to view your character sheet would be to open your character. But unfortunately doing that, it's a modal window, which means once it's open, you can't do anything else in Sojour until you close that window, which is obviously, it doesn't help you for character sheets. Whereas uh, having them displayed directly under the character sheets folder means that you can double click them, the character sheet opens, uh, and then you can leave it open basically because it's modeless and you can carry on using Sojour any way you like. And in fact, you can open as many character sheets as you want. And in fact, when I was playing one of the big commercial games, I, I think I had, I think it was seven or eight characters in my party. And the way I, I played Sojour, I actually opened up all eight character sheets, minimized them all, and then I just went down to the taskbar and maximized the ones I needed to play with as and when I needed them. But I, I will show you that when we get there. Next you have the journals folder for the campaign. That's where all your journals are gonna be. You can add as many journals as you want. Um, along with maps, they're kind of like the beating heart of uh, Sojour. It's where you're gonna write your narrative. The, the journals have a lot of advanced functionality. They can do spell checking. They've got built-in dice rollers. Uh, they can uh, run events from tables, uh, all sorts of things, uh, run turn sequences, and we'll cover those off uh, when we get there. Uh, then there's maps. Sojour allows you uh, to pull in maps for uh, using all sorts of techniques, and I'll cover that in more detail. Uh, and then finally, tables. Now, Sojour supports two types of table. It, it supports what it calls lookup tables, and lookup tables are basically a form of event table where <clears throat> you can have a dice range, a bunch of events, and it will roll for you, find out, look it up what the result was, and put that in a journal. Uh, and those tables are really advanced because they support uh, the ability to add modifiers to those tables. And they also support linkages to other lookup tables. So you could have a particular entry trigger up another role on another table and keep going. It's, it's a really uh, detailed system. Now, uh, again, a bit like turn sequences, there's a lot you can do with that. And uh, I only cover that lightly in this video and I'll leave it to another video to go into tables in a lot more detail. But like I say, all of this is covered in the manual. So if you want more information, just open the manual and have a quick read. So anyway, we're gonna cover maps first. And uh, in Sojour, there are three ways to add a map. <clears throat> you can add it the traditional way uh, from your filing system. And that's pretty much what every other VTT does pretty much as far as I'm aware. But it also has a very powerful screenshot capture utility where uh, you can pull up a map on the screen, either from a scenario PDF or uh, perhaps from another image. And then you can use the built-in screenshot tool to take a screenshot of that and pull it into Sojour as a map. And that's great because a, a lot of the commercial role-playing game companies, when you buy a scenario from them, uh, even if it's a, uh, an actual physical book like I've done, they generally supply you with a PDF version as well. And uh, this add maps and screenshot allows you to go through your PDF that you bought and actually take maps out of it and put them into Sojour. Uh, and it, it, it's a very quick and easy way of doing that without having to pay for the same scenario twice. And then there's a variety of blank maps. All right, we'll, we'll, we'll take you through all this now. So first thing we're going to do is, I guess, the traditional way of adding a map. Um, so here's a picture. Now Sojour lets you pull in PNGs, BMPs or JPEGs. Now, I've deliberately picked a map which should be too big for Sojour settings and because uh, I want to show you something. So let's hit open and we should get an error, hopefully. And no, maybe I've turned that off, but let's, let's give this a map name anyway. So uh, we'll call it Carl Manor. We'll have a look at our settings. Maybe the map's smaller than uh, what's required. So let's have a look at our settings. Ah, no, it is disabled. Right, okay, fine. Right, let me talk about this, the setting. Um, I don't know what computer systems you own. I don't know how powerful they are. I don't know if they're like this one. I don't know if they're like the little laptop I test this on. I have no clue. So uh, Sojour has to be built in such a way that it, uh, it can protect itself and the memory resources. So when you get it, uh, because I've used Sojour before, this is already turned off because Sojour remembers all of your user settings, but you'll get this turned on and uh, what it does by default, it limits your map sizes to 10 megabytes and it also limits them to 3000 pixels. Now, in terms of the pixels, what that does, if Sojour encounters any maps more than 3000 pixels on side, it will automatically 
downsample them. So you'll lose a little bit of quality. If your map is over 10 megabytes in size, it will just plain stop you from importing it. Now both of these values you can change. You can make them as big as you want. Or as in my case, you can even disable them. Uh, like I say it's only there as a safety feature. And in fact, uh, unless your intent is to go nuts on really huge images, I would probably recommend leaving that off anyway, even though it's turned on by default. Uh, so as an aside, uh, during testing, Sojour was tested with maps up to around, I think, 150 megabytes in file size and about 10,000 by 10,000 pixels. That's a, a pretty big map and Sojour seemed to work quite well on this system, but I don't know uh, whether other people's systems were able to deal with that, hence why we've got um, these series settings here. Well, let's say, if these settings are giving you hassle, either up the values or just turn them off, basically. So here's our map. Uh, looks like any other map, but now that it's in Sojour, uh, Sojour's graphics system, which is one I wrote myself called Ionian, uh, lets you do things with this. So we can now zoom in nice and smoothly, and we can pan nice and smoothly. And this is all the kind of stuff you want for a nice, smooth role-playing experience. So that's all pretty good. You can also use your mouse wheel as well, which is a little bit yeah, jerky. I prefer to use this because it's smooth. So, uh, but the other thing Sojour does is uh, the, the map, having a map is just an image is fine. And in fact, many VTTs do that. But Sojour goes one step further and lets you scale these maps. And that's where the real power comes in. So we're gonna scale this by using the scale button. And that pulls out this dialog. Now this is resizable. It's just that Windows 11 and it's, uh, I don't know why they designed it like that, but you no longer get the little um, drag bars on these type of windows. So. But it is there, so you can resize this. So we're going to scale this. Now, the way this works is you pick a measurement system. It will default to the measurement system of your rule set, but it will let you pick a different measurement system. However, say I was to pick Imperial, the map that, sorry, the scale that this applies to the map will still be metric. Uh, it just enables you to register it using Imperial measurements. And that's handy because you might have a map that is actually has a scale on it that's imperial you want to pull it into your metric campaign so you pick imperial go through this tooling and then it will automatically so draw will automatically convert it to metric or whatever your rule set's using now so um the rule set we've got here it is metric so we're going to pick metric and you can pick your units so we're going to stick with meters and now uh if you're lucky, your map will have a scale on it already and you can just uh, use that, but this one doesn't, so we're gonna have to take a guess. So we've got a, what looks like a cart there, and I reckon, what, like you can fit two people side by side on there and a person's one. Um, let's say that cart's about two meters in width. So all you need to do is pick a value here. Uh, two's already there, but you can actually type anything you want in here. You know, uh, uh, it's up to you, but we're, we're gonna go for two. Next, you pick the, uh, color. Now this is quite important. Uh, now that color, it determines both how this registration tool works in terms of the color, but it also determines how, oh sorry, what color the scale and the measurement tools are on your actual map. So you want to pick a color that stands out. Uh, you know, red's pretty good for this map, so we're going to leave it on red, but you, you could change it to one of any number of colors, including making your own with defined custom colors. So we're going to leave that on red. Uh, we're now going to press the register button and get across there and all you need to do because we're using the cart as our reference i'm going to click there so the first left click uh, and now you've got this little rubber banded line with a, a measurement by it which is i mean here we've set it as two meters it's two meters but it, it can be anything you can make it kilometers whatever you want and all you need to do is drag that to what you think is going to be two meters on this map and let's say we thought two meters is about the width of this cart so let's do that so we've now registered that so social reckons this map is around 105 meters by 69 meters and hit okay so once we've done that you'll see we now have a map scale on the bottom because everything is now scaled so so right away scaling a map gets you a map scale which is obviously quite handy for role playing games so it gives you a sense of ranges but you don't have to guess ranges on this because once you scaled your map the measurement tools become available so let's go through those we, we give you three measurement tools you can measure range 
Uh, and these are um, zoom stabilized. So as you're measuring, you can zoom in, out, pan around, and it automatically scales the arrow to uh, still be readable. And you know, you can pick where you want. And uh, basically these scaling modes stay on uh, until you disable them. So, uh, and you can actually anchor this. So say I really wanted to know the range of the cart, you put the arrow on the edge there, click, so that's 22 meters. But the second click anchors your measurement to the map. So um, it stays on the map until you either create a new measurement or you undo it. Now, the other things you can measure in Sojour are area of effect for, you know, those explodey things that happen in many role playing games. So that's a nice circular area of effect. And again, as I mentioned earlier, yes, it's showing it in meters, but that's because my rule set's in meters. If you'd, if I'd picked Imperial, you'd be seeing feet, yards, and miles, all that kind of thing. So don't fear the metric system. Sojour does support Imperial as well. And again, same thing again, the second click anchors it to the map and it, it becomes part of the map at that point. And we can clear that. And the final one, Sojour provides you with a, an arc measurement. And again, you move this around, uh, and you can also change the width of the arc while using the control key in your mouse wheel. So it's 45, now I'm changing it down to what, 30 degrees. And again, you, you can zoom and pan around as you're playing with it. And you know, and once you're happy with it, second click anchors it and then you can just leave it there. Uh, the only real limitation is Sojour only allows you to have one measurement tool up at a time. Uh, and when you finish with it, you kind of clear it off and it, it goes. So that's the measurement tools. What else can we do with maps? Well, Sojour provides some crude drawing tools. Uh, now you can use these to either annotate existing maps or more likely you'll create a blank map and use these drawing tools uh, to knock up uh, those crude encounter maps. Because we've all been there, yet you're playing a role playing game and all of a sudden this random encounter happens and you need a map. Uh, so Sojour gives you the ability to quickly draw one uh, and yes, it will look pretty rough, but it should be enough to trigger off the old um, uh, imagination engine to uh, to imagine what's going on. So I'll show you the tools that are available. There is a, a free draw, um, which enables you to draw various bits of the map. And once you finish drawing it again, it becomes part of the map. You can change the color of what you're drawing from here. Uh, so let's go blue maybe. And you can change the width so uh, from here. So let's go for the biggest width, which is width five. And then you can again draw again away. Oh, there we go. And again, they, they're saved with the map. They, for intents and purposes, they become part of the map. And uh, you can get rid of them uh, by using the eraser tool. So uh, it has free draw. What else does it have? It also has uh, a drawing tool for drawing straight lines. Let's go down to a slightly smaller width. So. Uh, and the way this works, the first click, you get a rubber band, click again, a rubber band, and so forth like that. You can use that to draw nice straight lines. And when you get to the last one that you don't want, you right click, and there you go, you're done. And again, once you're done, it becomes part of the map. It's kind of, and it's obviously saved to the map, and we can erase that, we don't want that. So you can also draw rectangles. So your first click gives you this rectangle which follows the, the mouse cursor. You can use uh, the mouse wheel to rotate it. You can use mouse wheel shift to change the height and mouse wheel control to change the width. And you know, once you're happy with where it's gonna go, you then click again and it becomes part of the map. And again, you could pick colors and widths as mentioned earlier. And we can of course delete that. And then uh, finally on the drawing front, we give you circles. Same kind of thing, it, it sticks with the uh, the mouse cursor, increase the size of the mouse wheel, uh, and then you can just drop it where you want. And again, it becomes part of the map until you erase it. So one other feature um, Sojour provides is you can add text to your maps. Now the limitation is that you can only add one line of text. Uh, maybe in future versions of Sojour, I'll allow you to have multiple lines, but that line could be as long as you want. So uh, I don't know, let's put one in, let's call it. The manner. So you type in your text, hit OK, and then you get some text to follow your mouse cursor. Now it's in the color that you picked up here. You must pick that color first, but you can change the opacity of this um, by using, I believe it's, is it, yeah, it's the shift wheel. So uh, you can change the opacity. Let's go for a 
maybe about that. So it's semi see through basically. And you can rotate it around, you can change the size of it. And you know, once you're happy with it, again, left click becomes part of the map. And uh, it's obviously saved on the map. And you know, if eventually you want to get rid of it, you can use the eraser and get rid of it. So Social does provide various measurement tools and uh, various annotation tools. I'd say that those annotation tools uh, during playtesting, I find, are very rarely use the drawing tools except for random encounter maps. But annotation, I tended to use that a lot. Uh, so I would tend to create maps that had no annotation on them at all. And then as my characters discovered what something was, I'd write a little note on there to say what it was they discovered. So it's quite, quite handy. Another thing you can do with maps, and I guess this is for those people that perhaps want to use Sojour as a mapping surface, is you can have them fill the entire Sojour window by clicking this button here. And there you go. So this map is now filling up the window, basically. And uh, I guess for some people that have um, big monitors or perhaps tables that have monitors built in, you could use this as uh, a mapping surface and move your tokens around and perform combat on this. Now when you're done, you click the button again and the left hand pane shows up. So th that's the basics on the map side. There is one other thing I, I will show you and that's map linking, but we'll, we'll come on to that after I've added a few more maps. So the next way to add a map, and I guess this is one of the more powerful features and maybe even a unique feature to Sojour is you can add them from a screenshot. So for this example, we're going to pretend we have a scenario book. Um, here's our scenario book. This is a terrible scenario book, by the way, called uh, Kyle Manor. It's a PDF that I wrote. It's using um, like weird Latin. So hopefully it doesn't mean anything to anyone because it's not supposed to. Um, so I'm obviously not going to use a real scenario book here because I don't want to break copyright, but here's one I've made up with maps I've made up. Now, I highly recommend if you are going to take a map from us, a scenario book, you make it as large as possible. And I'm guessing that's as big as we're going to make for that. And all you need to do in order to capture this map from your scenario book is go to Sojour. Don't worry about Sojour being in the way. Sojour will automatically hide all of its windows when you take the screenshot. All you then need to do is click add map from screenshot. And then your mouse cursor changes into a crosshair. So the first click gives you this rubber banding rectangle. You don't need to hold your mouse button down. It's not like Windows screen capture. Here, uh, I'm, I'm mouse free right now. I can just move the mouse around. All you do is pick the other corner. And uh, I think that's right, right there. And click once more and that captures that and give it a name. Uh, let's call this more. Journey, that? Yeah, I do. Right. And then hit OK. And there you go. We capture a map directly from our PDF and it has, it can do all of the things that uh, a normal map can do. Now, as I say, there it's looking a little bit blurry and that's because uh, of the size of map. You, you want to go for as big a maps as you can, basically. And again, we, we can scale this. So, um, and once again, like most role-playing maps are out there, there's no scale on this. So let's, uh, we'll have to invent one here. Uh, so obviously we we'll stick with metric. This is a zoomed out map, so we're probably gonna have to go to kilometers. And I reckon it's about 10 kilometers between here and here. So let's put in 10 for the distance. We'll leave it as red, because red's a good color for this particular map, just like the last one. Hit register scale, click there and we'll move our 10 kilometers to right there. And there you go. So Sojour thinks this map is about just under six kilometers by uh, three kilometers in size. Hit OK. And you have your map scale. And as I mentioned before, uh, this works for Imperial as well. So had this been an Imperial map, you'd be looking at miles and, and so forth. So uh, this feature is not to be underestimated because um, it enables you as an owner of various scenario PDFs to literally go grab the maps in those PDFs and pull them straight into social with a minimum of effort so you can get on and play. And this is without having to spend lots of money on a digital version of your scenario specifically for a VTT. It's a great money saver. So now that we have a second map in, we can actually show you another feature called uh, map linking. So. Uh, 
basically this is a zoomed out map of the countryside and uh, right in the middle there is Kyle Manor but this is also Kyle Manor this is like a zoomed in map of Kyle Manor so the two maps are kind of related and in uh, Sojour you can actually relate them together with a map link so we're going to add a map link to link this uh, Kyle Manor here to this Kyle Manor here and the way you do it is you click the map links button or alternatively you can actually right click and go add map link and you get this little red circle which I'm guessing you can't really see there unless we zoom in. Uh, now you can make that circle as big or as small as you like uh, using control mouse wheel and basically that uh, circle is going to become your hotspot uh, for clicking to uh, move to the next map so I reckon we're going to need a hotspot about that big I think would be pretty good. And you can edit these after the fact so you know if you're not happy with it the first time fine. So you click that and then you get to pick which map you want to link to. It won't let you link to itself obviously but it will let you link to other maps in that campaign and here you go so Carl Manor and okay that and when you okay it it goes and you think oh what was that for it's all gone but that, it's it's still there if I wave my mouse over Carl Manor now see you, you get the um, tool tip for Carl Manor and notice the cursor changes to hand so it's a crosshair here it's now changed to a hand with Carl Manor I wanted to do double click and boom it takes me straight there and you can link as many maps as you like together and again that provides a nice easy way of linking your big campaign map to all of your I guess little scenario areas and that way you don't need to go find those maps you can quite literally browse your big map uh, find the map link and double click now for those that actually want to see the map links uh, there is a button here where you can make them visible and then they stay visible I suspect most people will play with them hidden because they kind of spoil the aesthetic of your map basically. So uh, that's pretty much everything on maps that I, I want to cover for today. Uh, uh, there is more but that's in the manual and we can uh, perhaps cover that in a, a different video. So you got your maps. The next thing you're going to want are tokens and things to run around on your map so um oh ooh, no there's one more map thing <laughs> almost forgot so sojour allows you to create a third type of map I've, i should have remembered this and that's a blank map and again that, that's for the um as i mentioned so you know those odd encounters so we call this an encounter map and sojour has a number of built-in blank maps uh some were squares some were hexes all of them were different kinds of colors so if we go on and if we go for brown with hexes and hit OK, we've now created an encounter map. And you know, you could use the drawing tools to um, put stuff on this encounter map uh, in order to draw, draw a quick and dirty map. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to bother for real here, <laughs> but you, you get the drift. And uh, of course, like um, all maps, you can uh, register to scale this. So let's go do that for this one as well. So I don't know, what do we reckon? Five meters, I guess, for... No, let's make it two meters. So make each hex two meters, richer scale, and it be a bang. Bang, registered, okay. And there you go, we now have a, a blank map ready to go for a random encounter. Now, that is really everything around maps. <laughs> but I, I think I've covered it all now. So anyway, uh, going back to where we're going to go, which is characters, we're going to add some characters uh, to Sojour. And uh, it's just in case of hitting add character. Um, so I'm going to give this one a name. Uh, what should we call it? Cora. And you can add the tokens uh, using various things. You can either add them from a picture or uh, you can take a screenshot uh, and uh, much like we did with the map and again that's powerful because you, you can take uh, a screenshot from your scenario book and actually turn it into a nice round circular counter and I'll show you that in a second but for the moment I'll show you the I guess the traditional way now also note we got a character sheet with this um, and it's the one that we defined down here for free so this is uh, cool what? save that and uh, Let's add a picture for her. And again, this is, I guess, the standard way that most of the VTTs do this. Okay, and she's there. Uh, now, uh, one thing to talk about um, 
In most other VTTs, when you import uh, tokens, they kind of display the tokens at the image size that you imported at. Uh, Sojour doesn't do that. Uh, Sojour um, unifies all token sizes to being around one meter in size. Uh, and that's a deliberate decision because uh, that way, when you're pulling in tokens from a variety of digital sources, you don't need to worry about getting them exactly the same size. You don't need to worry about that at all. They can all be a, of many different image sizes, but they'll all display as exactly the same size on the map, unless you change this relative size value. So a relative size of one represents basically a human and generally means the token is going to be about one meter in size. Uh, there are various options for framing and transparencies. I'll show you that later on. We'll just stick with what we have for the moment. So we'll okay that. And that does several things. For a start, uh, Cora appears as a, uh, in here uh, uh, for editing later on. We also get our character sheet here. So as I mentioned earlier, when it's opened from here, this is, uh, it's, it's modeless. So, you know, you can go back to here and carry on working with Sojour. You can open up more character sheets. You can minimize it. And as I did, uh, I discovered the best way to do this was to actually open up all your character sheets, have them minimized, then you can uh, maximize them uh, when you want to play with them or widen them. So it's quite a handy feature. So uh, what you can do now, you can actually bring uh, Core onto the map and Sojour automatically scales it. So for example, if I zoom out, if I drag from here, look how small her token is because it's automatically scaled for one meter. But if I was to zoom in and then drag, notice how much bigger it is. Because again, Sojour automatically knows the scale. Uh, and that's one of its most powerful features, the fact that it automatically unifies uh, token scales. And you can drag your uh, character from either here or you can drag them from here. That's up to you. And wherever you, uh, and it is drag and drop. So you drag, release your mouse button, boom, they're on the map. And they become part of the map. Now you don't have to take the default size uh, that you're given. You can use your mouse wheel, oh, sorry, that rotation, use control mouse wheel and make it as big or as small as you want. And it's completely up to you. Uh, I'm just going to delete that and we drag out, just get the default size. So you got your token on the map. What can you do with them? Well, for a start, you can move them as you'd expect, uh, like all VDTs. And to move a token in social, it is literally drag and drop. Now, because I've registered the scale on this map, look what happens when I drag her. See how it automatically calculates the range? So if I drag her there, she's going to move 5.73 meters if I let go. And there you go. And that's how you move it. And you can always see how far. So she's moving about 10 meters there. So that's a great way to make sure your characters are moving at exactly the, the distances that you expect them to. And of course, you can use the measurement tools and do a whole bunch of other things like maybe open a character sheet from there and so forth. So uh, that's a, a, a pretty, I guess, neat feature. So, okay, let's pretend, let's go back to our uh, made up uh, scenario book, our terribly made up scenario book, Carl Manor. And uh, when we scroll through it, we look through it and say, oh, look, there's a character here called uh, uh, Aiko. I think that's how you pronounce it. I'm sorry, my Japanese is terrible. Um, I think it's Aiko. We're going to go with Aiko, but if this offends anyone, uh, let me know in the comments and I'll, I'll try and quote the better pronunciation. So anyway, uh, we, we got Aiko here and as a Sojour user, I've decided, yes, she's an important character. I want to pull her into Sojour. How do we do this? Now, in most other role-playing game, uh, sorry, most other VTTs, you might have a problem there, uh, but Sojour gives you the tools to do this. And again, all you need to do is make her visible and then on add characters, you simply add a character, give her a name again. And then for adding the picture, this time we use our picture from screenshot rather than the normal app picture. So you click that. And again, you get the crosshair and all you need to do is pick the bits that you want to be on your counter. So I don't want the frilly bits on the edge, so I'm going to be careful to not pick those. So one click to pick the top corner, another click to pick the other corner, I think. That's about what we want. And bingo, uh, we, we have uh, Ico brought into the system. Now we could use her like this, but the problem is she'll appear as a, a square icon on your um, 
uh, on your maps you'll appear square up here as well it just wouldn't look very good so social provides you the ability to frame your tokens with nice uh, beautiful circular frames so uh, you can pick a color as well so what would be a good color for her uh, green uh, or purple let's go purple so we need to pick a color and so draw automatically turns uh, that picture into a counter and hit OK and boom there, sh there she is and you can drag her onto the map uh, just like the original one and you get all the measurements so look how easy that was we, we literally took a picture from our pretend scenario book of course you'll be doing it from your real scenario books and what in a few seconds we created a counter that we can use uh, straight away and as I mentioned before notice how I didn't care about the size of this picture this picture here could have been any size but uh, Sojour automatically scales everything to be the same size uh, but it does provide a way to change the size by changing the relative size value and we'll talk about that uh, later on I'll actually demonstrate it so one more thing with tokens is it can also help you with uh, transparencies so uh, let's go create another character uh, let's add a picture oh Isla is this one right so we'll add Isla so this is Isla, uh, now she, uh, it's probably hard to tell in the video, but her background is white and the transparency, if you look at the transparency color box is gray. So she doesn't actually have a, a decent transparent background. Now, unfortunately, because of the way Sojour import works, you can only pick transparencies up front. So this is gonna be a little bit around the houses, but stick with me, because I just wanna show you like a before and after effect. So this is the before effect. So uh, we've just imported her as normal and, uh, Oh, I'll talk about that circle in a second. If you drag her onto the map, she's scaled properly, but look at the awful uh, white background. <coughs> it, sorry, excuse me. It doesn't look very professional at all. So um, let's move her from there. Let's actually uh, remove Isla from here as well. Whoops, double clicked. And what I'll do, we'll re import her again. A picture and what we're going to do we're going to take advantage of the transparency tool so all you need to do is click pick transparency and click the the color on the image you want to make transparent and we're going to go for the white there see that's turned white hit ok and now when I drag Isla to the map look at that nice professional looking token and again perfectly scaled even though in reality these three pictures are all actually very different sizes and um, Sojour has automatically scaled them and unified them to look good together. Uh, and that's, I guess, one of the powers of the mapping system, basically. So uh, I guess that's the two ways of adding a character. Um, now with these, they have character sheets uh, because we've defined them to have character sheets uh, via here. But you can clear those documents and add any other documents that you want. But so far, at least for this version of Sojour, every token or character can only have one related document. Uh, now I'm guessing in the future I'll, I'll remove that limitation and enable you to add multiple documents, but that's a future enhancement uh, right now. So we have another, a number of characters here. Oh, by the way, because, um, uh, because these are characters, Sojour treats them as unique. And by that, what I mean is they can only appear on the map once each. So if I was to drag Isla to the map again, all that happens is, is she moves. You don't get a second Isla. Now you will for monsters, but there's something else, but for characters and campaign assets, you're gonna get one. Now onto that red ring you saw, uh, one thing Sojour does, if you move your mouse over any character, it centers it on the map, so you don't need to go looking, you get a nice little red ring to show you uh, the character. It also does that with, um, uh, NPCs as well and I'll, I'll show you that uh, later on. So that's characters and hopefully uh, you're happy with the, the way the map works and the fact yeah, it can do all this and do it smoothly as well. There are some VTTs I've used which were quite clunky in the map department but hopefully Sojour isn't one of those. So what I'm going to do now, we're going to add um, now let's add some tokens. 
Uh, now, tokens, they represent, uh, I guess, your mobs, uh, your monsters, and uh, they're at rule set level rather than campaign level, because generally speaking, uh, rule sets have a number of monsters that are related to them. Um, I don't know, like Dungeons and Dragons, you've got Monster Mango and so forth, uh, and that's why I put them in this level. Now, uh, tokens, unlike characters or campaign assets, you can uh, multi-instance them in to create crowds of monsters. So let's create one. I'll call this one Goblin, because everyone likes a good Goblin. Uh, and let's go add picture. And right, so one of the differences uh, between a token and all the others is it has hit points. Uh, now, the, the reason for this, and I might come to regret this design decision later on and I might change it, but the, the original reason for this is in Sojour, the intent is you'll manage the hit points of your main characters on their character sheets. But for throwaway NPCs, uh, they'll manage their own hit points through this mechanism. Uh, that's the idea, and it just saves you having to do it. Now, you can either put in a fixed value, or you can actually put in dice. And um, Sojour lets you go absolutely nuts with dice uh, expressions, but we're not going to go nuts right now, just with uh, a standard 2D. Notice it's gone red because 2D is not a legal dice combination, but 2D6 is, and that's gone black. But let's go 2D6 plus 2. So uh, that's the hit points, and the idea is whenever you drag this uh, goblin uh, to the map, uh, it, you'll be asked to give it hit points. Now I can actually show you that now. Plus, you can add an associated document as well. Uh, in fact, let's do that now, and we'll call this, I don't know. Goblin details. You can call it anything you want, obviously. And for this, because I don't have a built-in thing, I will create a blank PDF for that. And I'm not going to go nuts here. I'm just going to go goblin details. Uh, obviously, you add a, a lot more to this than what I'm typing here. So that's our goblin. Hit OK. He's now in our palette, and to use him. Just like the others, you drag to your map, and just like the other tokens, Sojour auto scales it. So we've zoomed in there, notice it's a bit bigger. And again, all of these tokens are different sizes, but Sojour knows how to unify them. Now, by default, you get the maximum roll that the hit dice can give you, but I don't want that, so I'm going to press the button to roll four. Oh, that's really abysmal. Let's go for something. 10, right, cool. 10 is a much better value. Now, it also sets the current uh, hit points to be the maximum, so you can actually start them off as wounded uh, by dropping that value down. We'll leave that as 10. Okay. Now, when you wave your mouse cursor over him, you'll be able to see, uh, you should be able to see that's goblin. Yeah, that's just goblin, but we can actually grab and drop an another one on. Eight. We're not doing too well on the hit points, so. Uh, now you'll see uh, that Sojour should have numbered these. So they go Goblin 1, Goblin 2. And they all have their own individual hit points and so forth, which we'll cover later on. And you keep adding as many of those as you want. And that's the big difference between uh, tokens and the tokens palette and the others, is the fact that you can keep dragging them on and pretty quickly create those encounters. Uh, and like I say, thanks to Sojour's auto scaling system, everything appears the same size. Uh, now I'm going to show you one more token, so I want to show you uh, some of the size functionality and also a thing called uh, direction stabilization. So we're going to add a brand new token, I'm going to call this one Horse. Again, I'm going to add a picture, and we've got a horse. Now, there's several things that are that is different from a horse compared with some of the others that we've done so far. Um, so the first thing is, horses are quite big normally. Uh, uh, so, and you wouldn't necessarily want them to appear on your map to the same size as the people. So, uh, I'm no real horse person, but I'm guessing <laughs> they're about three times bigger than a human. So we'll make that three. You can actually go to um, fractional values as well. So if you've got um, a monster that's smaller than a human, you can go like 0 0.01 or whatever you want. It, it supports all of that. But the other unique thing with this counter is unlike all the others, this is a top-down counter. We're actually looking straight down on it. And if we were to leave this as it is, uh, you'd end up with a weird situation where as the horse was traveling around the map, its nose would always be pointing to the right. And that kind of looks a bit off. Uh, and, and that plus the fact that many uh, role-playing games take uh, like your front into account, uh, I decided to add the ability to directionally stabilize it. And what that does 
is it forces the token to always face its direction of travel. So all you need to do is tick it. And then you get this little dialogue, and in here it's asking you to set the heading. So the heading's where the horse's head is in this case. So about there, we're not actually too precise. 91 degrees, yeah, that's cool stuff for government work. And then hit OK. So that's now direction stabilized. Uh, it's also three times the size of a normal person. So now when we drag a horse across, see, a little bit bigger. And uh, let's drag another one as well. So our two horses on there, horse one and horse two. And uh, as I mentioned, because these are direction stabilized, when we move them, look what happens. They automatically face their direction of movement, which makes it look a lot more natural. And obviously these circular counters don't need that. Um, uh, it's up to you uh, whether they make things direction stabilized or not. But regardless of whether they are or not, you can always rotate an image by using your mouse wheel. So, you know, you're not fixed by that. Uh, including the direction stabilized ones, you can rotate those around. And so you'll remember where you rotated them. But the minute you move a direction stabilized one, it'll go back to facing uh, the way it was moving. So, yeah, quite a handy function. So one other thing whilst we're in the tokens palette, uh, obviously at some point you're going to end up with a lot of tokens in here. So you get a search functionality. So if I go like horse and it happens in real time or goblin, I guess if I go O because both have O, you get, yeah. So you can type in there the name of the thing you're looking for and this will automatically filter that down. So I guess that's tokens. I won't bother showing a campaign asset because they are pretty much identical to a character. The only difference is uh, they don't show up on the uh, the characters pane up here. So uh, I guess one other thing I want to talk about characters is occasionally you want to deactivate a character, especially you know you might be on scenario two of uh, the Northern Reaches, and maybe some of the characters aren't involved in that scenario, and you don't want them cluttering up up here, and you don't want them cluttering up down here. So you can actually um, deactivate them. So. If we take Isla, for instance, if we right click on her, we can deactivate. And when we do that, she disappears from the map, she disappears from up here, her character sheet disappears, and for all intents and purposes, she's not around. And you know, uh, if you're playing this properly, you'd probably close that as well and, you know, out of sight, out of mind. And then eventually, you'll come on to a campaign a scenario which needs her again, and then you can right click and then you can choose to reactivate and then she appears again. Uh, you get her character sheet back, she appears up here and she appears back on the map in exactly the same place where you left her. So you can uh, uh, basically carry on with things. So uh, I guess that's all I want to show on uh, tokens and uh, maps. Uh, hopefully uh, you folks are happy with what you're seeing. Uh, and if not, let me know in the comments because uh, obviously, the, the more feedback I get, uh, the better I can make the product for, for all of us. Uh, and as I might have mentioned already, uh, I, I'm, I'm not just writing this to sell, although I, I am obviously selling it. I'm also writing it for myself. I actually use Sojour to play my games and I, I have uh, three campaigns going on right now in three very famous and commercial role-playing games and the social works incredibly well for those and I've saved a bundle of cash because social screen capture functionality enables me to pull in maps and tokens without having to rebuy my assets again in order to use with my VTT. So uh, I think what we're going to do now, I'll briefly show you a table. Uh, should we show you table? No, let's show you journals because journals are the next big important thing. So journals are where you're going to add your narrative. Uh, now you can call them anything you want, but I generally recommend that you number them and just to give them a bit of order in the journals pane because the journals pane sorts them out by alphabetical order. Uh, so let's call this uh, the encounter. <laughs> Very original, not. Right, that creates a journal. Now. Uh, to open a journal, you can see it's already open there, but you can double click it here and that presents it in this right hand window. Now, I. Uh, uh, Social is primarily designed so you play it like this. You'll have a journal on the left and you'll have your map on the right. And the idea is that you'll write the narrative on this side and move your counters around on that side. 
So there's a lot that's in a journal. Um, you have the current date and time in your campaign, and you can actually move that backwards and forwards. So you can add a minute, add an hour, even add a whole day. Oh look, and it's a public holiday. And it knows it's a public holiday because oh, we don't need to even need to go there. You can actually double click this. You'll see a little, uh, see it says double click. And there you go, and yeah, put a card in. Now, we actually set that as an event, so the event system obviously works. Now, um, this uh, social generated text is always in light grey italics, and it only ever goes in the active, visible journal. Um, uh, in the olden days, in the earlier versions of social, it used to go in all campaign journals, but the problem I've discovered was it ends up vandalising your older journals. <coughs> Excuse me, which you obviously don't want to happen. Um, so you can move uh, your, your time forward uh, like that. Uh, you can also move time forward using built-in macros. Now, I can actually show the other helper window that I mentioned earlier by pressing this button here. And just like the map helper window, it's completely modeless. So, you know, you can carry on working away with it up. Uh, and this gives you all of the, uh, uh, the, the keyboard shortcuts. And there are quite a few for the journal. Uh, and it remembers where you last left it. So, like I say, we're going to increment time now. The downside of incrementing time up here is, I know, let's pretend three hours have gone by. You could do it up here and go, you know, one, two, three. The problem is you end up with three of these entries, which makes your journal look a little bit unsightly. However, I will point out that because Sojour is a solo journal, you can edit anything. It's not like a multiplayer journal where once something's happened, it's set in stone. You can, you know, so if you didn't like any of this, you can you know, let's just get rid of all of that. And away you go. And that happens with everything you see in the journal. But there are other ways to alter time. So uh, as per those shortcuts, you can say on to three hours, you actually go plus three and then capital H for hours. And it automatically goes forward three hours and tells you it's gone forward three hours. And uh, what it does, all journals that are part of this campaign go forward three hours, although only this one has the writing in it to tell you that that's happened, but all of them will have the same time and date up here. And this is a great way to, uh, to manage your timer and using those shortcuts, you can move forwards or backwards uh, in seconds, minutes, hours, or days. So uh, there's a lot of flexibility there. Now these journals support um, some uh, basic uh, fonts. Uh, so uh, you obviously got your normal um, uh, text. But you can do things like change the color by double clicking here. Yeah. So I might want to go red. And maybe we'll make it underlined and bold. And even maybe add some italics. Uh, and uh, it's yeah, you get going a little bit of freedom there. Now, um, one thing Social does do in order to make updates as simple as possible, wherever you drop the cursor, it automatically adopts uh, the font uh, that's there. And you can always tell what font is there by looking at your font button. So right now we can see it's underscore, bold, italic, and red, and you can turn those on and off by clicking on them. Now, if I was to click up here in this grey text. You can see it's just italic and grey, and it means that I can immediately start typing. And it automatically adopts the text in that area, so you don't have to keep fiddling around and faffing around to um, uh, to get the appropriate um, uh, font. Now, sometimes, like here, I've gone next line and I want to get back to black normal because that's the, the normal text. Now, Sojour always enables you to get back to uh, black normal text by pressing Control D. Very quick shortcut, straight back, and then back to normal text. <coughs> so, yeah, pretty flexible on that front. Now, Sojour also has built in spell checking. It never used to, but I got so annoyed at my own spelling that I added it into the system. Uh, and it has uh, two types. It has dynamic spell checking where it will highlight badly spelt words, um, like this one. Uh, 
There, highlighted a bit red. <laughs> uh, I can't spell definitely to save my life. Uh, it's 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 my yeah, it's my kryptonite basically. So um, yeah, so as you're typing, uh, Sojour will highlight uh, badly spelled words briefly in red. I I did originally have it underscore in red, a bit like Word and that, but one thing I discovered is that um, role-playing journals have so many made-up words in them that you end up with lots of red underscoring everywhere and it just becomes a, an eyesore. So I abandoned that and I've now gone for the let's show things up very briefly um, in red. So like... And again, that should go red. Now, uh, what can you do about it? Well, you can actually right click on it and Sojour should give you a bunch of options. So two things, first it goes red to say, hey, you spelt this wrongly. And then it gives you some spelling options. So let's go for the real spelling. There you go. And just saying well, hello. Oh, there's loads there. Uh, let's go hello. And uh, that fixes your spelling for you. But also, you can eyeball some text in your journal. And, you know, we all know it. You've been typing away and you look at a piece of text and you think to yourself, is that spelled right? I don't know. I'm not too sure. Well, you can find out by putting the cursor over it and right clicking. If it's green and it, like this one, it only has one option, it's spelled correctly. So, a very handy feature. Uh, and uh, I say it wasn't in the original version of Sojour, but I added it because. My own personal spelling is so dire and I couldn't stand. I'm one of those people, I know when I spelt something wrong, but I don't necessarily know how to correct it, which is why I added this. Now, uh, commercial spell checkers are really expensive and this is one that I've written myself. It kind of uses stuff deep in the bowels of Windows. Uh, now, theoretically, if I've read the API documentation correctly, this calendar, sorry, the, the dictionary for the spell check should automatically pick up the language that your operating system is using. Uh, however, because I live in Britain and because my OS is English, I've got no way of proving that. So I have to wait till somebody buys this in maybe Spain or Portugal and they get back to me and say, hey Rob, your spelling works great in Portugal. Or, hey Rob, the spell checker doesn't work at all in Portugal, in which case, please let me know. But it should work because... Uh, I've been reliably informed from the API documentation that it does pick up other languages. So you get spell checking, uh, what else do you get? Right, so you also get um, a dice roller. Now, Sojour never had this originally because my original ethos was you'd have some physical dice in front of you and you just roll them, but so many people asked for it on Reddit, I thought, okay, I'll give you a dice roller. In fact, I've given you two dice rollers and I'll show you both of those now. So you get the, the general window-based dice roller here, where you can type in what you want to roll. And let's say you can go nuts on this, but let's go 2d6 plus 3d4 minus 2d8. And let's go plus 3. Yeah, that's a pretty nuts uh, dice expression. And notice how it goes red when it's not a good dice expression. So we have our dice expression and all you need to do to roll it is just press the button and there you go. So you wrote all that and I wrote a six at that time, 11 and so forth. Now you can pick options and settings to go for detailed dice rolls. So let's enable that now. And what that does is when I roll on the same dice, it'll give you a breakdown. So there it's saying I rolled 11 on all those dice and plus three. I got 10 on 2d6, 7 on 3d4, and 9 on 2d8, and it added all those up and gave me 11. So it, you can have that nice breakdown if you want it. Now this dice roller, it remembers your last 10 dice expressions. So you know, you could type something else in there like, I don't know, 3d6, and roll on that. And, and what it does, it orders this list uh, in the order that you last ran things. So, uh, over time, uh, you'll have a list of 10 different dice expressions with your most used ones towards the top. And every journal gets its own historical dice list, which I guess is pretty good. Now, if you were to roll an 11th expression, uh, Sojour removes the, uh, the least used one from the list and adds your new expression to the top. So that's one kind of dice roller, but Sojour also provides an inline dice roller. Uh, which you can access with the square brackets and uh, the braces, or I like to call the squiggly brackets. So, and all you do, 
you type, start off with a square bracket, and again, you put in whatever expression you want. So, say 2d20 plus 1d4 minus 4. And then, when you're happy with your dice expression, you close it off, and Soldier automatically replaces the expression with a number. And that's handy for those occasions where, I don't know, um, you go like. Um, uh, like that. Uh, it's, a, it's another way of rolling dice. And now you can use the braces or squiggly brackets, I call them, in order to get the more detailed readout. So you can go, uh, this is 2d6 minus 2d6, and this will give you a detailed breakdown. There you go. So got six, ten on one, four on the other. So it does dice. Uh, you can also, there are macros in here for inserting the time, which I forget offhand, but luckily as I mentioned earlier, Sergio comes to help. So, what we got? So, we can insert a long date and time. So, that's plus LD. So, let's do that now. And there you go. You get the, the current date and time of your campaign. And note it's using your campaign calendar in the format that you've set it up as. Uh, so, yeah, it's very, very powerful. Uh, and of course, you can roll that backwards and forwards. So, have I covered all the texty based stuff he says, cheating by looking at his own. Uh, <laughs> Uh, menu here. So it has undo and redo. Uh, you can also save like control S or cover that. Um, oh, start expressions are done, types have done all that. Uh, conversations we'll cover in a second. So yeah, uh, as you type, uh, you'll notice a little warning sign appears over the save uh, um, button. That's telling you uh, your changes haven't been saved. Save them, just click it. But you don't need that save button at all, really. And the reason why is Sojour automatically saves your journals whenever you close either Sojour or the journal. It's automatically saved. Uh, the only reason why I added this is because, mainly because of my paranoia, because, you know, imagine you're on page 255 of your epic, and, and now you're wondering, hmm, is this saved to disk? <laughs> uh, and, you know, you could take the risk and close Sojour down and reopen it and hope that it's there. I mean, it should be there. Uh, but to give you that peace of mind, I give you a manual save button as well, so you can save whenever you want. Uh, like I said, there's no real need for it, because Sojour does automatically save, but I, I, I fully appreciate that people that put in a lot of hard work will want to safeguard what they're doing. And in fact, Sojour actually does a third kind of save. If you go to uh, settings again, uh, by default, it saves everything every 60 minutes in the background anyway. So, you know, even if you don't do anything and you leave Sojour open, every 60 minutes it's going to save uh, your data for you. So, uh, let's go back to our thing here. So, what else can we do? We can get our characters to talk. Now, you know, I mean, you could get them to talk anyway just by, you know, using speech marks and hello, but Sojour does provide um, a, a, I guess, a unified way of getting characters to talk. And the way to do it is you use um, uh, control and the number keys uh, based on your character's position. So Ico is in position one, Arla is in position two, and Cora is in position three. So if I want to get Ico to talk, I'll go control one. Also, the insert uh, icon, and then, or you can turn it off and go back to not talking, but you know, we'll say she's talking. A little speech bubble up here. And, you know, maybe Cora's talking as well. Add her in. Hello. And because I'm a computer programmer, hello world. <laughs> and then, uh, as soon as you've uh, finished talking, it's the usual uh, finish off with speech marks, and boom, it goes back to normal. And it actually goes back to the previous fonts you're using. So if you're using red there, it'll go back to red here. So that's a nice system to give you simple, consistent speech that does stand out a bit because you've got the tokens there. You can get your NPCs to talk. Notice they appear on the um, uh, this little NPC bar. And as you wave your cursor over them, it also centers the map on them. Uh, and in fact, the other thing you can do with NPCs here, he says digressing, is I don't know if you can see on the thing, they all have hit points that we generated for them as a little green bar. You can actually see how many hit points they have by looking at the uh, the highlighter right, and so forth. But what you can do with Sojour is when the mouse cursor is over them, is you can use the mouse wheel to change their hit points. Now, if you look at the map, you actually see uh, some floating hit point numbers as I do this. So watch, see nine, eight, seven, you go all the way down. And when you get to zero or less, uh, the counter disappears. 
It's still there on the map. And the reason why is some role playing games simulate additional damage and keep adding damage. Or, or maybe a mage comes along and says, Aha, you're coming back to life, goblin. And then you can go and add the hit points back, and boom, it reappears again. You can't go over the maximum hit points for that particular character. So that one maxes out at 10. If we pick one of the other goblins, uh, so he will max out at 8 and so forth. It remembers all that. So that's a quick and easy way, uh, I guess, to manage the hit points for a particular NPC. But as I say, I, I, I've not designed uh, your characters to do, that, to do that because my assumption is you'll change their hit points on your physical pen and paper, or alternatively, you, you'll change it on your character sheets, uh, which is why they're handled a little bit differently. So uh, going back to the conversation thing, you can also get your NPCs to talk. And again, it's a similar kind of thing where that's position one, two, three, four, five, and you just go control shift. So if I want the first goblin to talk, control shift one, and maybe get goblin three to talk, and then they go, hello. And um, you hit return to get rid of it. And you can even mix your conversation. So maybe the humans and the goblins are all talking at the same time. So you can go something like, uh, Let's add a horse in as well, because we can do that kind of thing. Uh, not that I'm sure they'd all say that, but you can do it if you want to do it. Now, there is a third kind of uh, way to talk in Sojour, which got added as a result of testing. Uh, and one thing I noticed was sometimes when you're playing a game, uh, you'll have a character in, in your journal, in your narrative, that doesn't exist as an actual... Um, uh, token or character or anything else because they're too minor but you want them to talk you want them to have the same kind of stylings uh, so the easy way is in social is go control t and again to stop to come out of that mode speech marks and get back to normal again and it'll go back to uh, the original font that you're at so yeah, the, the journal is very good in that respect uh, in that yeah you, you can have uh, fairly attractive, well, attractive to me, uh, speech happening in your journal. So uh, what else can we do here? Uh, right, oh yes, we've got um, an empty drop down here and there is another one which will appear when we add it and that's for turn sequences and for tables. And I think what we'll do is we'll create some events so I can show you those in action. Uh, and by the way, uh, all these NPCs here, you can remove them from that by the here or from there. You can even view their details, like say goblin details. So I didn't put much in there. Um, and notice it's that the menu's got the name of what I called it. So here I called them goblin details. But if that was uh, some other special thing, you can give it whatever name and that appears there. And you can move from the map there, or you can move from the map here. There's lots of ways of doing that. Um, oh, the other thing I didn't show on the map. Yes, you can move everything around and they animate nicely. And actually, uh, Sojour enables you to have multiple things moving at the same time. You, so, you know, if I do that and then I can, uh, if I can get good on the mouse that is. So, you know, you can have as many things moving at the same time as, as you can rapidly click. Uh, but what Sojour also allows you to do is, is move something on the map without animating them. You know, occasionally you, want, you might want to move something or someone uh, miles away. And to do that, it's control key and drop and they appear 13 meters away automatically without moving. And again, there's no real need to remember this because if you click this, uh, it's all in there. Uh, so going back to something I did mention, the fact that Sojour saves uh, your state. So if you look here, we've got um, this journal open. We've got these counters here. And Sojour, it remembers the state of the map. It remembers how far it was zoomed in. It remembers where the character positions are. It remembers how many maps you open. So you know, if I was to shut it down now, and then reopen it. And I, you know, I haven't pressed any save buttons. When I reopen it, it should all come back. And there you go, exactly the way you left it. And you don't have to bother um, faffing around, basically. Although I noticed it hasn't saved the window size. Maybe I need to add that. But yeah, it, it, for the, it, it's, it's good enough for me right now. I'm sure if I get people that want it to save the window size, I will add that, uh, obviously. So uh, that covers the basics there. So we're now going to talk about tables. So. Sojour supports many types of table. Uh, 
well, two types of table, I'm exaggerating by so many. Uh, there's a, a normal data table. Um, uh, let's call it some alliances. And, and a data table, it's just really a done table, really. You know, you can add as many rows and columns, fill stuff out. Uh, um, and it's just there for you to store data in, basically. Uh, 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 because you know we all have those campaigns where we want to store stuff and you can resize that and do all sorts but uh, more interestingly social supports um uh what i call lookup tables so uh, uh, a, a typical one you'll have in a game is uh, like a weather table and what lookup tables do is they enable you to have automatic uh, sorry to be able to roll on these tables to have things happen in your journal and in fact, this one here, it's got an error already, even, even as I've created it. And the reason why is because uh, when you create a new table, it gives you uh, typical entries just to let you know how to create them. And the bottom one is a link to another table. Uh, but that name there needs to be the name of another table. And there is no table called link to another table, so it's gone red. And in fact, if I click the little triangle here, there you go, one invalid lookup table detected, which is fair enough. Uh, We'll get rid of that in a second. So you can, again, like the other one, you can add rows and, ooh, now we've gone up to three errors. And that's because if we click this, it's saying uh, one invalid row range detected. Yeah, because there's no row range in that row. And it's also saying uh, one row with invalid events detected. Yes, because there's no events in that one. Uh, and this is real time. So as you type, these uh, errors go up and they go down. Now, Sojour, uh, it doesn't enforce those errors because at the end of the day, it's your prerogative to set up these tables any way you like, and it's not for me, the programmer, to say, ha you can't do that, because that takes away your flexibility, which I don't want to do. So uh, it will just display the warnings. You can look at them. You know, if you're happy with them, go for it. Leave the table as it is and just go for it. And you can always test it with the old test button. Anyway, let's go back to this weather one. Uh, so let's go for um, storm. Let's go for rain. Maybe cloudy. And see how the error count's gone down as as I'm typing. And maybe we'll do seven to eight. Uh, maybe we'll make that sunny. And then you know, all the errors are just gone. And you can test this by hitting mm -hmm. test. And there you go, sunny. And what you'll find when we go back to our uh, journal, that should appear. There you go. And if we move the cursor down and click on it, Look at that, stormy today, rainy, sunny, and you know, you, you have these uh, uh, random events that you can create in these tables, so it's quite handy. Uh, but there's more, there's a lot more to tables than what I'm showing you here. Uh, for example, uh, let's add, let's change that to 12. So uh, by default, uh, social roles the entire range of the table in this case seven to, uh, sorry one to, to twelve uh, uh, and of course for those that know about dice uh, a one to twelve roll is a very flat roll in, in that every individual number has the same chance of appearing but as we all know if you start rolling combinations of dice it's no longer a flat roll you get a, an uneven distribution for example if you roll two six-sided dice seven will come up a lot more often than any other number with uh, 2 and 12 coming up the least number of times. And the reason for that is if you write down all the combinations of the two dice side by side and, and write down what they total up to, many combinations add up to 7, but very few add up to 2 or 12. And that's why you get a bell-shaped distribution. And you can actually change the distribution simply by uh, going to dice expression. Uh, and it's giving me a warning straight away, presumably. Yeah, no dice expressions. Let's give it a dice expression. And if we go on a 1d6, and it's still giving us a warning. But we can still use it. So with 1d6, we're getting cloudy. Let's see what the warning is. It's saying dice range does not cover the whole table, and it's perfectly right. And so let's call it 2d6. We've still got a warning. I'm guessing that's because this is starting at 1. And now it's gone now because it's going for 2 to 12. And now we've got that bell-shaped curve where sevens are going to come up more another two. We're going to get sunny more often than not with this. Yeah, as we're seeing, very badly designed table, by the way. Now, uh, other things you can do 
So you can add modifiers to this because we've all been now, you know, there's, uh, you, you make a roll and then you've got to look at various modifiers. So let's add some modifier tables and we'll make these ones based on, um, let's say terrain. So that adds a modifier table. You can add as many modifier tables as you wish to each table uh, and this will have scroll bars appearing, keep adding them. Uh, they default to mutually exclusive on, I'll show what that means in a second. Uh, and you get a whole bunch of example uh, modifiers to show what they look like. So uh, let's go plus three for uh, desert. And maybe minus three for, uh, I'm really bad at this. Um, let's say tundra. <laughs> this is the worst design world ever. <laughs> Uh, and you can use zeroed and what that means is it'll zero uh, all modifiers or you can even put in a, a complicated dice expression. But I'm going to leave it as just those two there so we'll get rid of the last two. And what this does, uh, in fact we don't want those to be mutually exclusive. Yes we do want them to be mutually exclusive because you're always going to be in a place and you can't be in both at the same time uh, in this case. Uh, and maybe we'll put clear in, just make it more complete and just make that zero. So uh, when we test this, what you get now is this modifiers table where you've got to pick up a modifier. So, oh, my character's in a desert. So well, let's say they're in Tundra and then we apply the modifiers. That does the role and it's still sunny because of our huge seven to 12 range we got there. Uh, and that appears in the journal as well. So if we go back to our journal and, and re-roll on uh, the, the stormy table, on the weather table. See, this comes up and away you go. You can, uh, Let's go back for Tundra again and see if we get something. Oh, cloudy. We actually got a different result that time. Excellent. Um, so yeah, you can add uh, as many modifier tables as you wish. And I'm going to add one more just to show you what mutually exclusive off looks like. So um, let's add another table. So what can this one be about? <laughs> What's related to weather? Um, oh, I'm going to be really terrible at this. Uh, do, 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 do. Let's say... I'll just call it other because I can't really think of anything else right now. And what you can do with uh, this, let's have two in this one just like the other one. And we'll say, uh, we'll say, in fact, that's probably more realistically minus three, not minus not that plus three, we'll say. Um, Right, so, and we put mutually exclusive off by clicking on it. Now what this does, it gives you two different types of modifier. When we hit test, you can see that the mutually exclusive ones are always in a drop down, and you must pick one, uh, basically. But the other ones, which aren't mutually exclusive, you can pick any combination that you like. Although this is a really bad design decision because I doubt very much that yesterday it could have rained and been sunny at the same time. I doubt that very much. So excuse my poor design, but that should work when you just hit play and code it. And of course, and you go back to your journal and you roll on the weather table, you get the updated table. There you go, sunny. And it, as I've mentioned before, you can have your tables access other tables. Um, so let's create ourselves a, a terrible weather table. <laughs> we'll call it extreme weather. So I don't want to go into this too deeply. I'll try and keep this high level. So, so we've got our extreme weather table and you know, let's put in some really extreme weather, hurricane, uh, monsoon. What else can we think of that's extreme on the weather front? Um, see, I live in England where we don't really have extreme weather, so tornado. That's probably, if I can spell it right, that's probably a... Uh... So, we've got an extreme weather table. Now, the extreme weather table, you can roll on it as its own table. There you go, we had a monsoon that time, tornado and so forth. But uh, what social enables you to do is actually link tables together. So let's replace this sunny with a link to the extreme weather table. And all you need to do is type in the 
ampersand. And it's red because it, I haven't given it a name. It, this isn't case sensitive, by the way. You just need to put in the full name. So we're going to go extreme weather. There you go. It's gone black, which means it's a great link. And that's good to go. So now this table is linked to that. Whenever you roll a 7 to 12, which should happen quite often because the way we set this up, it'll roll on an extreme uh, table. We can prove that if we go test. And we'll make it sunny just to really, uh, and we'll make it desert. We're going to really force it to go to the extreme table. We'll hit apply. There you go, tornado. And you could link many tables. And, you know, you could link a table to a table to a table to make this as complicated as you want. And you can still roll on the individual tables. And uh, same going back to your journal. So I can roll on extreme weather and get the extreme weather, or I can roll on normal weather and still get extreme weather if I get the appropriate results. Right there, tornado. So, yeah, it's quite powerful. I'm not going to go any further into this because um, you can do lots of stuff with tables. But one thing you probably have noticed is the alliances table, which doesn't have the little speech bubble by it. That doesn't show up in this, and that's because it's um, it's not a lookup table. And lookup tables don't show. Uh, sorry, lookup tables only show up in this, and uh, not your standard data tables. So that's tables. Um, I guess the last thing to show is turn sequences. Uh, and this we are definitely keeping simple. This is, this is one of those things where I could quite easily do an hour video on turn sequences. Uh, we're not going to do that. So I mentioned earlier that turn sequences are a way to model turns. Uh, and be able to to drive your turns forward. And we're going to make this one really, really simple. And we'll call it a combat round. Uh, now, in the description, that's the text that's going to appear in a little window, which I'll show you in a second. And generally speaking, you you want aid memoir text because you've all been there. You play your role playing game, and there's like ten different things you can do in a combat round. And unless you've played the game continuously, remembering those ten different things is a right pain. But you can add those ten different things in this description so that when the turn happens, you can read it off. Right? You don't have to remember it. Uh, I'm just going to though do stuff because I'm being very unimaginative <laughs> but we'll leave that there uh, you can pick how long it lasts for we're going to leave it in seconds we're going to go for six seconds you can also pick whether there's an initiative tracker attached to it uh, and yes we want to track initiative because this is combat so let's tick that now you can pick whether it runs every turn or whether it runs just on the first turn of combat now um, now, I think all of the games that I own, you only roll initiative once, and that's right at the beginning of combat, so we'll leave that unticked. And then you pick whether the initiative values are high to low. And again, most games I've played, the higher the initiative... Well, no, that's a lie. Some games I've played, the higher the initiative, the, the higher people go first. Other games, like I think RuneQuest, for instance, uh, it works the other way around. The lower their strike rank, the faster you go. And you can tick or untick that, depending on what, and you can name the phase. Now you can add many more phases, so you know you can have a turn that's got four ind independent phases, and you can assign some of those phases to initiative and some not. So it gets complicated. You'll have to read the manual for the details, or alternatively, watch the video that I will put up on turn sequences later on. Um, but for the moment, we'll keep this one really, really simple because I, I want to keep this video relatively short. So we have a combat round, last six seconds, it ain't going to do much other than display do stuff, but at least we've got enough there to be going on with. So we hit OK. We go back to here, and what you should find is it's turned up in your drop down as a, a turn. So we're going to pretend that in our tornado, which is probably a bad time to fight, that the encounter that we see here on the right is happening for us. Uh, and the way to kick it off is to just hit the arrow. And you, what happens is, uh, well, many things happen. Uh, firstly, the um, uh, the journal gets updated. So you can see combat round started, combat round one, and it's saying initiative A, set initiative to proceed. Right. Now, normally you'd be able to continue straight away, but because I asked for the initiative tracker, this has come up, which you see here, and this and this are telling me you can't continue your combat round until you set the initiatives. Uh, and I've set it so uh, high is good. Now, um, some real random numbers are going to go in here. Uh, what I am going to say is, though, this system automatically orders things. So, because I made this high to low, if I was to put like 54 in here, it will uh, put high. 
iCobev Cora. So you don't have to worry about ordering, it automatically orders things for you. And you use tab to move on to the next thing. Uh, so let's go 22, 22. Uh, so I'm completely making this up, so <laughs> don't worry. And for the last one, because uh, there's two ways of inputting the number. You either use tab to or, or leave the field and that uh, makes the number of the initiative or you wait a few seconds. So this one, I'm going to type in 12 and you can tell when it, the initiative's in because the text goes black. So if I type in 12, give it a few seconds, you see horse two turn to black. There you go. And in fact, because that was the last initiative to go in, We've now got the text for a combat round, which unfortunately for me is just do stuff. But if you were doing this, you'd put in all that excellent text to say, yes, you can do one attack, you can do one parry and one minor action. You can put all that in this window, which you can drag around anywhere. And that way you get an aid memoir as each turn or phase goes by telling you what you need to be doing. So uh, notice it's updated the journal. So you can now see uh, that there's the initiative, how we set it. Now you. The uh, counters that appear here are the ones in the active map. And you can actually remove counters. You know, if Isla's not in the fight, you can actually remove her. Um, or And you can even move things around. So say uh, Goblin 1's uh, lightning fast and even faster than Korra, we can actually move him up. So now, now the initiative's changed. It updates the initiative here as well. And uh, the way this is designed to work is... Oh, by the way, like all text, this is editable. Uh, because this is a solo journal. This is your text. It, it's not a multiplayer game. It's going to get rid of that. We don't want it. So anyway, it's saying I calls up. Um, so and the idea is, uh, and you can tell she's up because she's highlighted here. So I say uh, I can attacks the goblin and hits. Maybe we'll take some goblin hit points down. Obviously, uh, a good role player will be a lot more elaborate with descriptions. Please don't do what many role players do, where they roll the dice and go, "They've hit, they've missed, they hit, they miss." Because that's not good narrative. You you want to uh, make good narrative about your combat because it, it really uh, brings us out. And if you look at my manual, I actually have some pretty good narrative in there as examples. So anyway, let's let's pretend for a second that Ico's been. So you, you then click the next. And I'm saying horse one is up. Now, I don't know why a horse would be involved in combat, but maybe this one's an angry horse. So horse one is doing stuff. Uh, and notice um, user-entered text is black. The uh, initiative tracker text is in gray. And you can go through. And notice it centers the map on whoever is up and puts a little red ring around in temporary, just so you can see. And it always leaves that as blue and has the text in here. And you go through, and when you get through to the last one and hit next, the turn goes by, and six seconds have gone by. So it's keeping track of time as well. Now, we can prove that. Um, obviously, this isn't showing seconds up here, but if we do 10 of these, we should see this go up to 15.32. So if you bear with me whilst I hit next many, many times. That's three, four, five. You'll never do this in real life, hopefully. <laughs> Not uh, eight, nine, and it should be after the tenth turn, I believe. There you go, 1532. So this whole system is integrated and it's keeping track of your time. And I believe, <laughs> I hope this works. I hate it when things don't work for demos. If you. Um, take the uh, hit points down of someone to below zero, I'm pretty certain the system will remove them from the initiative tracker. There you go, that goblin's gone. Uh, until he gets resurrected, then he turns back up on the initiative tracker. So all good stuff. So, so that's what turn sequences are from a very high level, and you can go really nuts on these. You can have multiple phases and all sorts of things. You don't have to have the initiative tracker if you don't want it. And when you finish, you just hit closed, and it says combat round complete, and then you carry on typing stuff. And I say you can have as, as many journals open as you want. Uh, it's completely up to you. So, have I covered everything I want to cover? I think I have. He says, looking all over the user interface. Yeah, that, that is pretty much it. As I say, there's no need to panic um, when you first get this. Uh, I know things might seem complicated, but there, there are helper windows for both the journal, 
and also the map. And of course, you've got a nice 100 odd page manual, which you can view at any time, which explains how to do things. So uh, that should help as well. And as I mentioned earlier, Sojour remembers everything. If you shut certain um, parts of the tree down, have certain maps open, have certain journals open, uh, when you shut it down and reopen it, it will reappear uh, just as you left it. Uh, so you can carry on playing your game. Let me just have a quick look at settings, see, make sure I've covered all of those. I think I have. Yeah, you got the usual warn on deletion. Um, some people don't like warnings saying you're about to delete something, some people just want to get on with it. Uh, dynamic spell checking, that's interesting. Um, I suspect most people are going to like the badly spelled words being highlighted in red, but I can also suspect some people will be irritated by that. So you can actually turn off dynamic spell checking so those highlights don't happen. However, you can still right click on the words to find out if they're well spelt or not. It's just you don't get the highlighting. Uh, detailed rows I showed you. Transparency aggressiveness, that's down to the transparency tool, which I showed you earlier on characters. You can but basically, like we pick white in um, Arla's case, but the tool doesn't just pick white, it picks a few colors either side in order to make a better transparency. And you can pick how aggressive that is. Uh, and you know, if you put up to, I don't know, say 100 for instance, it gets pretty aggressive and might even start taking out some shades of gray as well. Uh, and it's up to you to, to, to pick uh, the relevant value, I guess. So yeah, that, that's what I wanna show. Uh, it is designed for solo play, uh, and because of that, everything's stored locally. There's no subscriptions to pay. Uh, you can play everything at your own pace. It remembers everything. Um, you can edit everything in your log. So it's not like a multiplayer journal where once something's said, it's in stone. You can actually add more text at any time. Oh, yes, there are a few other things. Yes, there's quite a few other things I need to cover on a journal, sorry. <laughs> Right, so you've got the usual find facilities if you wish. Um, and you can find all instances of the word back. I think there's only one there. Uh, you can also zoom in and zoom out if you uh, want to do that. And double click to set it back to 100%. And each um, journal remembers its setting. And this reminds me, I need to show you documents as well, but I'll do that in a second. Uh, other things you can do is export this. So, um, you know, uh, maybe you think, ah, oh, man, this is a really cool campaign and I want to export it into a rich text document to share with my friends. Well, you can do that. You can click this button here. Uh, let's set this a desktop and let's go my campaign. You call it whatever you want. Hit save. And that, there you go. And that appears. Yeah, I do trust my uh, work and block. And there you go. Or you could open that up in Word or whatever. So yeah, very easy to export your journals. Uh, you're, you're not kind of, they don't have to stay in Sojour. You just export them all. Uh, and speaking of data, this is quite important as well. I mentioned earlier, or maybe I haven't, so I don't remember, but uh, Sojour tries to store all your data in a non-proprietary format. The idea being you spent all the hours building it. So, you know, wh why shouldn't you be able to use it in other tools? So, and it gives you an easy way to get there. And that is, all you need to do, you can pick any node in your assets browser and most of them have a browse folder button. So you click that and that takes you straight to where all the data is. Now Sojour uses very scary GUIs to name everything. Uh, that's just to help it keep track of things. But everything in here is in a standard format. So like the map I imported, that's a standard image. There we are, it's an image program. So you could open that in one of your image programs. The token I created, standard image again, and standard image. Uh, and even the journal, we can open up the journal and that's actually a rich text document. So Sojour endeavors to save all of your data in a non-proprietary format because I acknowledge people use many other tools and you might want to use some of what you've done in Sojour in other tools. Now, journals is one way to keep track but uh, of text, but as uh, I think somebody in the Reddit forums requested this, and also I decided I needed it as well. Uh, if you create documents in Sojour, let's just create a document. Um, uh, what should we call this? Campaign notes, oh, I can't spell for my life. 
And again, it could be any RTF, it can be any PDF, or it could be anything from your um, uh, document templates. Uh, I'm actually going to go for a blank uh, RTF so I can write in it. So, and uh, these campaign notes, it's a stay on top window for a start, but it's, it's modeless. So I can go back to my journal, I can carry on doing stuff. But then I can carry on writing stuff in here. And this uh, RTF document, it's the same control in programming speak as a journal. So you get all of the facilities, you can change fonts. So, you know, you can change the color. Maybe we'll go blue. <clears throat> Excuse my voice. And of course, uh, it has spell checking in. So it gets all the facilities. Oh my God, I really spelled that badly. <laughs> Let's leave that as it is. But it's got all the facilities that um, the, uh, uh, the actual journal here has, it, including dice rolls, I believe. So let's give this a test. I haven't really tested this, but you never know. There you go. So including dice rolls, it's underscored because I left it as underscored. Um, so yeah, very handy. And you can have as many of these open as you wish. Uh, and it remembers for the last words, you know, if I close that and then I reopen it. Uh, do, 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 where is it? It opens back where it was. Uh, now, what I would say is the RTF functionality in Sojour is a little bit crude right now. You can do some basic font changes and that's about it. But internally, it does support the full uh, RTF format. So, for example, you could paste in actual tables and images and Sojour's documents will honor those. They'll appear. Uh, it's just that you can't create them from scratch. Right? It's just a limitation. Uh, maybe in the future, for future iterations, I'll, I'll add more functionality, but I, I think there's enough there to be getting on with. Uh, so, have I definitely covered everything now? I think I have, he says, looking at everything. That's, yeah, that's definitely what I want to cover. Right, so that's it. Uh, I hope that what you've seen looks useful. Uh, it's certainly been useful for me and as a solo role player it saved me hundreds of pounds because um, uh, one of the uh, virtual tabletops I was using they were you know I, I own a lot of stuff from I, no, I shouldn't really mention the companies but I own a lot of commercial stuff and uh, this particular VGT they're saying yes you do own that scenario book and yes you're gonna have to buy it all over again in order to use it with this VGT Sojour doesn't do that. With Sojour, you get screen capture tools to enable you uh, to actually, like we did with the North Sojourney map, to actually capture maps directly out of your scenario books, to actually ca capture counters like we did with the ICO directly out of your scenario books. Uh, and because of that, it saves a lot of money. And, uh, and, and you know, it's, I, I think it's a good feature. Uh, so yeah, for me personally, uh, for a start, I find it easier to use than many of the VTTs, a lot easier to use. Uh, it's, uh, and because of its solo focus, it, it's just it's just very easy to use for me. Uh, you obviously couldn't use this for multiplayer because it doesn't have communications. And what I would say is this uses a lot of technology from another project of mine called Ancient Armies. And Ancient Armies has my own custom communications layer which supports UDP, TCP, and a whole bunch of other scary protocols. So, and I'm a web developer, that's my day job. So if I got enough demand to make this a multiplayer one as well, I could very easily put some kind of browser interface on this as well. Well, he says easily, that's a lie. It would take me a while to do, but I could do it. Uh, but that's all down to, to demand. And as I say, my play style is I'm, I like to play solo and the reason why I like to play RPG solo is when you're playing in a group that's quite a big commitment uh, you uh, and most um, uh, sessions they last several hours so you've got to commit to meeting that group uh, for several hours at least once a week and you know I, I don't want to be that guy you know the, the one that never turns up uh, uh, so I, I'd much rather especially as I'm a busy person I'd much rather play these solo and that way I can explore the narrative at my own pace and and play at my own pace. 
uh, which is just the way I like to play it. And I suspect it's just the way some other people like to play their games as well. There's no rule saying you have to play an RPG um, with people. Now, I will put up a video, and I've promised to do this before, and I still haven't done it, but I, once social settles down in terms of the dust, I will put up a video to uh, show you some of the techniques that I use to play solo, because you can play RPG solo. In the uh, When I first started, I thought you could only do it mechanically, that is, you know, generate a few characters, maybe have some combat, but no, no, no. You can actually role play solo as well, provided, and this is the key thing, which I didn't believe at the time, but it is the key thing, is to have a journal and write down the story. And, and then in that journal, not only do you write down what's happening, but you start to elaborate on your characters and you start to create some of their quirks uh, and, and your story starts to build up that way. Uh, but yeah, I'll have a, a completely separate video on that. So yeah, hopefully, this is just the kind of software people are looking for for their solo games and maybe it's the kind of software that will help them out if they want like a, a map surface uh, to use in their multiplayer games because uh, this is a pretty decent map surface on the whole with lots of tools to you know help you out and do things so yeah uh, obviously any feedback uh, pop it into um, into the YouTube comments uh, I'm open to feedback. If there's anything you feel needs to be added, I, 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 I'll take it on board. I can't promise I will add it because there's only one of me. Uh, but I, I will certainly add it to my management system. And you know, if something gets in the votes like the dice rollers did, I will add it, uh, guaranteed. Um, so yeah, and uh, in terms of when it will go on sale, um, I've got two more videos to do and then it'll go up so hopefully in the next week or two so keep an eye on the description of this page and I'll probably post on Reddit anyway uh, and there I'll have a link and as I said it's going to cost you ten dollars which I think for what it does is a very very fair price uh, and for that you get updates as well and, uh, and no DRM so yeah uh, that's it uh, so uh, feel free to like and subscribe and you know uh, maybe even tell your friends about it uh, and thank you uh, for taking the time to watch this it's been much appreciated uh, goodbye